Good afternoon and evening, everyone, and welcome to week two of Digital Literacy with Justin Hardy. And tonight we are talking about how to use search engines and search engine operators. So if this is our class overview for the evening. These are going to be the three major topics that we're going to cover. So if you guys have any questions as we're going along, please feel free to ask those in chat. We're going to talk about how to conduct research online. I've got a few tips to show you how to make your research more efficient and one of the, ment the mentality that you want to take when it comes to the research process. We're also going to talk about how to source professional gear in the online space and what to look for in uh, quality product reviews. And we're also going to talk about the week two module and the activities that you're going to be taking care of this week. Uh, just like you guys submitted graded activities last week for your first uh, week of the course, you're going to be doing the same thing again. So this is going to be how the pattern goes, right? So, and if you're working with me this month and I am your specific instructor, please reach out to me via phone, messaging, email me. I get back to you guys uh, pretty, pretty quickly. I think June can attest to it. I get back to her pretty quickly when she messaged me or she leads a little bit of feedback. I try to make sure that I'm active and supporting you guys every single day of every single week, right? So let's talk a little bit about search engines and I'm just gonna caution you guys. I'm not talking about this too much because this is a topic that warrants its own lecture all by itself. So we're just going to hit the very basics, right? So we're going to talk about search engines and Google search operators. And that's as far as we're going to go, because it's so tempting to really dive into the minutia of what search engines are. But what is a search engine? Basically, a search engine is a web-based tool that enables users to locate information on the internet. Think of all the different times that you've ser used search engines in the past. Think of all the different search engines you've probably used. You have Google, that's the big one. You've got Bing, you've got Yahoo. Somebody named some of the older ones. You guys remember Lycos? You guys remember Ask Jeeves? What about those? You guys remember those back in the day? AOL search. <laughs> DuckDuckGo is another search engine, right? Firefox is a web browser, but that's very close, but Ask Jeeves is one of those old, old school ones. This is from the time period, guys. You guys actually might be a bit too young for this, but search engines used to advertise on television. Straight up. Hotmail used to do it. Ask Jeeves, Ask Jeeves used to do it. Lycos, those are three search engines that used to advertise on television for you to hop on your computer and use them. Um, if you guys can remember, uh, if you guys can believe that. So that was a long time ago, but we've come a long way since. And primarily the, the web browser that most of us use is Google. How many of you use Google? Pretty much every day. I should be high-fiving myself because I use Google all the time, pretty much every day of the week, right? What about Bing? Any Bingers in here? <laughs> Any? Chrome gang represent. Anybody use Bing? Damien says I use Bing. June sometimes uses it. What about Yahoo? Any Yahooers in here? This is this is old school right here. So some of you still use it. I haven't had a Yahoo account since. It's been like 20 years since I've had a Yahoo account. It's been a long, long time, right? So no matter what search engine you're using, performing a general search, Google search, a DuckDuckGo search, a Bing search, Yahoo, doesn't matter. You're going to get millions and millions of results. And let's see what that looks like in practice. All right. So this is going to be Google. We just do a basic search for the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this telescope. It cost $10 billion. Took almost 20 years to build it. It took about six months to get where it was supposed to be, and now it's actually doing science after launching, I think, December of last year. We've gotten some really beautiful photographs. We can see a couple of them here, and, and James Webb is just dropping new album covers every other week, it seems like. And this is some awesome, awesome technology. And we can see here, if we zoom in a little bit, for our search here, we're getting 37 million results. I don't know about you guys, but I don't have time to go through 37 million results, right? That's just a little too many. But if we go over here to Bing, look how many results we get. 523 million. <laughs> I can't do the math on how many more that is, but that's quite a few. We're not going to need this many results either, right? So if we go to Yahoo, do we even get a number on Yahoo? I'm not seeing it. But I imagine it's also going to be, if it's not millions, it's going to be in the hundreds of thousands. 
And again, that's also too many searches to go through in a reasonable time frame. So what do we do? Well, we could get a little bit more specific. So if we want to do the James Webb Space, Space Telescope launch date, try saying that five times fast, how many results do we get? Okay, 36 million up or down from 37. So that's still not really giving us a specific um, set of results. So let's get even more specific. Instead of the launch date, let's see if we can find any engineers that worked on it. Okay, that puts us down to 6 million results, right? So when you're doing research, you want to start with one key thing. Start very broad with your topic. Whatever it is that you're looking for, start, for, start with a big idea, right? And as you have that big idea, you want to whittle it down with a, maybe a couple of different specific keywords or maybe a different rephrasing of what you were looking for. So that gets you here. And then you're going to do more research and probably going to specify your keywords a little bit more. And that gets you here. And down here near the bottom of this cone shape, this reverse pyramid, this reverse triangle down here, that's the bit of information that you want, that very specific information that came from a very broad search that started up here. You hone it down to here. And that's essentially what research is all about, guys. You're coming up. Let's see if I can get this even more specific. Uh, NASA. Yeah. Okay. So that's perfect. So look at what we started with. We started with 36 million results, 37 million results, right? For James Webb Telescope launch date. Now that we, we this is our broad um, topic here. In fact, let me make this point even more salient. Boom. So we start with 37 million. That's our broad topic. And we specify that a little bit more with engineers. That gets us to 6 million. So we've gone from here to here. So we started with a search. Research got us here. Research again is going to get us here. So we're looking for James Webb's telescope, NASA engineers. So we go from 37 million results to 6 million to 2 million. Now, we're still using millions of results, but we're far closer to what we we're looking for in terms of our specific data. Like, this is what we want. This is going to get us there. And now, if we get even more specific than this, you might end up actually truncating results that might be helpful. Um, so there is a such a thing as getting too specific with your searches. Like if we were to like look up the high school graduation dates for NASA engineers that worked on the James Webb Space Telescope, we're probably not going to find that information. That's far too specific. It's far too niche. And what do you need that information for anyway? So it's probably likely that you're not going to find it and you're not going to need it. So do keep in mind that you can hone your research from broad to specific, but there are limits to this specific bit of information at the very bottom of this triangle that you can use. And that can be the basis for other research that you do. Okay, I found this information that was awesome, but it also inspired me to think of this other thing. So that, again, gives you a broad topic to start with. You whittle it down and you add that to your first piece of information. And you keep doing this over and over and over again until you get all the data that you need to be able to accomplish your goal. This could be designing a brochure. This could be writing a new song. This could be for a commercial that you're filming. This could be for a film that you're shooting. It could be for a screen uh, play that you're writing. It could be for a press release that you're working on, right? So no matter your degree program, doing research, finding a big idea picture and willing it down to the most salient point, the most important part, it's gonna be really important. You've gotta be able to do this for your bosses, for your coworkers, for your specific audience that you're trying to reach. What is your message? What are you trying to get us to do about it? And how much legwork did you do ahead of time so that people can kind of understand where you're coming from and have the context, right? So this is gonna be a really important skill for you guys to have. So no matter what, um, what search engine you find yourself using, you always wanna start broad and work your way to being more specific. And I have a few tools that can help that process be a little bit more fun and less arduous where you're not just swapping out keywords over and over again. You're getting exactly what you need in a specific sense. When you're not taking as many steps to get from here to here to here to here to here, you can go boom, 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 and get to where you need to be. So again, performing a general Google search, Bing search, Yahoo search in general, you're going to get hundreds of thousands to millions of results. Now, one of the ways that you can curtail that a little bit, make that a little bit easier to deal with, is by using search operators well, which will give you the ability to filter your searches so that your research process is still going to have a wide data set, but you'll have the ability to pick and choose what you want so that you're just filtering it down to the results that you need. You're not going to get all the extraneous results that are going to be outside the realm of what you're looking for. I'm going to show you some examples of what this looks like. 
So these search operators can be used to find specific social media posts, product listings, user reviews, you name it. And once I show you this process, you can apply it to literally anything. And now you guys are gonna see these and I don't expect you to take notes. There is actually a cheat sheet in the 2.4 project um, instructions that have all of these listed. So there's no need for you to memorize them. You don't have to write them down because I'm talking about them. You're gonna see these again when you open up the project document and look at all the instructions. You'll see the Google operators here. We even have a download for you. So you just click this and it is available for you to save. So again, you can use this as a Cliff's Notes while you're getting used to the process of using these if they're new to you. Okay, so the first one I wanna show you guys very briefly is finding a range. And this is very practical because this can help you shop within a budget. So if you're looking for headphones that are 150 to $300, you no longer have to sift through hundreds of pages of headphones. In fact, you might find something that you like here or you can scroll down and you can see articles that cover the 10 best headphones for 100, under $150. So whereas, look at what would happens if we just type in headphones here. What type of headphones are you looking for? You have headphones that are $50 right next to headphones that are $1,800. What kind of use case do you have for $1,800 headphones? It's probably gonna be high end. You're probably a music engineer. You're probably an audiophile, someone who really enjoys music and they appreciate it. This might be the set of headphones for you which is not gonna be the exact same use case for someone that has $50 headphones. If you're using $50 headphones to mix and master music, you are doing it wrong. You will not be using these headphones. This is something that maybe you give to your, your niece or your nephew, or you just keep them around the house as your banger headphones, that if something happens to them, you're not too upset. You probably would not daily drive these out and about when you're just kind of hanging around town. Like if someone knew what these were and they were of, the, of a mind, they would just grab these off of you and they have $1,800, right? So please be mindful of use cases for specific needs. And if you're just searching for headphones, you're gonna get anything and everything. It could be headphones that you need. It could be headphones that maybe you were looking for, but it's not gonna be directed. It's just gonna be a whole lot of nonsense here, right? How many results do we get? Okay, guys, look at this. Headphones gives you a, a 10, 1 billion results, 1 billion, 70 million results. However, if you put in a range here for 150 to $300, look at what we get, look at what we get now, 44 million results, which is far superior in terms of being able to focus down your search to what you need, right? And Miguel, yes, you can watch this later, so don't feel like you've missed out too much. We're just about uh, 12 or 13 minutes in. You haven't missed too much. But just to go, it just goes to show you that you can narrow your searches very, very quickly using operators like this, a range operator, and it gives you options up here. So if you're just looking for headphones that are in this price range and you're not looking to buy, you, but you, this is your budget, you can get in here. You can be like, oh, God, these skull candies look nice. These are a bit out of my budget, but that's okay. Let me check these out. I like these right here. And then you can bookmark these like we did last week where we had you guys bookmark some websites. You could do that. And then when it comes time for you to be able to afford the headphones or buy the headphones, the time is right, you'll have that available to you and you can just boom, go in, purchase it and you're good to go, right? Now, let's say you're looking for something that's a little bit more high end. You're not looking for $150, you're looking for $600 to $800 headphones. Okay, so you're gonna see similar results here, like the top 10 headphones, $600 to $800 headphones. Google's gonna give you some results that may or may not be what you're looking for, but this is gonna be far more specific than looking just for headphones in general, right? So you've got some up here that are 890. Uh, these are close to 1,000. These are 800. So notice here that our results, we're getting results that are a little bit higher than what we were expecting, right? So we can see that $600 to $800 is our range but we're getting headphones that are almost $1,000 in our results. Do we really need those? Probably, probably not. There's some $1,500 headphones over here and on and on. You can kind of see that they're really premium. They kind of give you the high end of the scale. And what Google is thinking, you have to kind of fool the algorithm sometimes. Google is thinking right now, if you're in the, the, in the market for $600 to $800 headphones, why wouldn't we show you something that's close to a thousand? Because that's really not much more money that you're spending. Maybe these will fit the bill for what you're looking for. You can grow into them. They have a feature set that was above and beyond what you were expecting to find at that price point, and you end up going for it anyway. That's kind of what they're hoping for with some of these more extravagant price points in here that really don't reflect what you're looking for. Notice that none of these headphones 
sets of headphones are under that range of $600. These are $599, $598, $549. You have to scroll quite a bit in this set to be able to find one that even goes underneath that range a little bit. And that just goes to show you that this range search operator is not going to be an exact science. So if you go in here and you type in, let's say 1100, 1000 to 1100, it's still going to give you headphones that are above and beyond that price point. Because again, if you're in that market, what's an extra $500 if you're already spending 14 or 1500, right? So the just goes to show you once again, that ranges, there's going to be results that kind of go beyond what you're looking for. And you're going to see results that are a little bit under what you are looking for. So it's not an exact science. So play with your numbers a bit, see what kind of results you get up here, scroll through some of these links to see if they're useful or not. And that might, again, urge you to research, re um, kind of like reformat what you're looking for to see if you can find a better um, result. But search engine operators are a good way for you to cut through the fact of what you're looking for, to find some salient points, find exactly what you're looking for, and then you can base your research, your refined research on those bits and pieces that you didn't have to spend a lot of time to find, right? So this is all about using your time intelligently. And search engine operators are a great way to kind of cut out all the inefficiency. The next one I'm going to show you guys is history of the United States from the year 1980 to 2020. So this is a range of years, whereas before I showed you a range of prices. And some of these search operators do have more than one function. Like if I put dots here, it will serve the exact same function as if I put a dash there. So some of these kind of vary a little bit, but a dash makes sense in this case for a range. And that's what we're going to use. Now for this one here, the history of the United States, you guys that are from the United States, it's about 300 something years long, 350, 350 years long. That's a big stretch of time, three and a half centuries, right? Now, if you're covering the entire United States history, that's completely cool. But I didn't live for the majority of the United States history. I was born in 1985. So I'm really only interested in the history that I lived through because I have more context to work with. Things that were happening in 1900 had nothing to do with me, right? But things that happened in 1990, I was there for that, right? So when you're doing searches, let me just illustrate this again. History of the United States, you're going to get 14 billion results. You're going to get the entire history of the United States starting from 1776. If you're really serious, you're going to start your research at 15,000 BC because that's when Native Americans were first going across the Bering Strait from Russia down into Alaska, down through Canada, and then into the United States. That's how far back you have to actually go to talk about the concept of the United States as a singular like entity, right? And even then, it didn't have that name. It got the name in 15 something, the year 1540 or 1560, around that time frame. I'm getting some of my decades mixed up, but you have a huge amount of time to cover. And I don't know about any of you, but the year 15,000 BC, not really that important to me. Ancient history. The year 1776 to 1789, also ancient history. Not interested in any of that. I'm not interested in filtering through these billions and billions of results. So again, we have our range here of the decades that I lived through. And we can see, of course, that I'm not a robot. And our results have cur curtailed our sales. So we started with 14 billion results. And we now have 795 million. Still a ton of results, but that's a, a huge number that's cut away. It's a lot of fat cut away. We don't have the entire history of the United States have to worry about. We are now worried about five decades, 1980 to 2020, right? And then we can click here. And then at this point, you're doing your research. So now that you found your initial search, I want this article, now you're doing research. What part of this article is going to help me accomplish my goals? Am I creating a project that is meant to entertain, persuade, or educate? Well, if it's meant to educate, I wanna make sure that I'm citing my sources correctly, right? So wired.com, please. So you're going to, again, check out the article, find some bits and pieces that you can use. Maybe look at the bibliography of the article and do research based on that information that was used to write the article in the first place. You guys kind of get my point, right? So whenever you're conducting research, using a range, whether for prices, years, any other thing that would designate a range, even miles, like five to 100 miles, if you're looking to relocate um, in somewhere like close to home, like you wanna stay in the same state, but you don't wanna be in the same city, here are all your options within 50 miles or 100 miles, right? So that's something that you could also use these for. So that's finding a range. Next one is exact matches. 
So you guys kind of saw this earlier, but if you guys can tell me who said to be or not to be, what character said that phrase, to be or not to be? It's the first part of a soliloquy. Who said it? Anybody cultured in here? Okay, Landon got it, perfect. Hamlet, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. Now, some of you have probably heard that statement before. You've heard that phrase before. You've heard someone say that on TV before or in a play or one of your teachers said it in English class. You're like, I've heard that, but I don't know who said it. What play is that from? Who wrote that play? Using an exact match will allow you to use incomplete information to find things that you are looking for. So you have the quote for something that someone said, but you don't know who said it or where the quote came from, but you know the quote. You just put quotations around that bad boy and you will be given the keys to the kingdom. You now know who said it. You now know exactly where it is in the actual play and you have the author who wrote it. And there's even a Wikipedia article about this specific phrase. It's so famous, right? And the reason I picked this is because I had to actually deliver this entire thing, this whole thing in English class for a grade. Imagine getting up without a paper to read from. You had to memorize the whole thing and then rattle it off while some guy is just going to sit there and grade you for all the mistakes that you made, right? Right. So this was very harrowing for me. I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. I'm glad you guys don't have to do that. It, this was a lot to memorize, right? So you're going to you're going to remember things in your life where you only have partial information, and you can use that partial information, feed it into Google, and nine times out of ten, I don't want to say that, I'm going to say eight times, eight times out of ten, it will be like, did you mean this? And you're going to be like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. Google, thank you very much. Now that I know the name of name of X, I can now do research on Y, which will help me get result Z, right? So consider the fact that you will sometimes have incomplete information when you're doing research. It might be a quote, it might be a range of years, it might be some sort of information. See if you can put an exact match to it and if Google can help you out. Sometimes it will work. This will not work on an academic search engine that is um, maybe proprietary. Like I know that we have academic search elite here at the LA Film School that you guys have access to. That's a whole other can of worms. But the gist of it is that it's an academic search engine that has peer reviewed papers. And sometimes the quotes in those papers are like, if you guys have ever read a scientific paper, they start off with $6 words and they only go up from there. So it's almost impossible to read what they're, what they're actually telling you, right? So you're probably not going to be able to do this unless you know the exact chemical makeup of the thing that you're looking for or the actual person that wrote it or some quirk of their style and the way that they wrote it. And you could use that as the basis for your search. But generally with Google, it has plenty of algorithms in the background that are gonna be like, I know exactly what you meant here. Uh, let's see if there's another quote that I can think of. Um, this is gonna be really interesting if Google can get it. Okay. It didn't. I was looking for if I could get the Morpheus's line from the Matrix, what is real? I can't get it. That's a little too specific. So there are some things where this will give you 49 million results and real is, cap is something capable of being treated as fact. And Google's going to be like, did you want this? And this is a little too literal of what you were looking for. So if I type in Morpheus, or better yet, plus sign Morpheus, Google's going to be like, Oh, you mean this scene. In fact, this is what is real. How do you define real if you're talking about what you can feel? So 20 seconds into this scene. So once you give Google a little bit more context, it can point you to the exact second of the footage. Oh, did you mean this right here? And you're like, yeah, that's exactly what I meant, Google. Thank you very much. So sometimes you will have to combine your search operators to get to exactly what you wanted for. So we didn't have to search up the matrix. We didn't have to look up the script. Right? We didn't even have to type in Lawrence Fishburne. We just did what is real plus sign Morpheus and boom, we can hit play specifically from this point and listen to him say that. And it's the start of the suggested clip. So Google is pretty handy when it comes to doing research, as long as you use some of these search operators. And if you can use them in concert, that can increase your efficiency even more, which I can show you with our next one, which is excluding terms. So you can add terms with a plus sign, but you can also get rid of them too. So what do you guys think of when you think of Jaguar, just in general? You might think of the animal, you might think of the football team, 
you might think of cars, SUVs, right? So there's going to be a couple of different interpretations for what Jaguar means to you, right? And Jaguar, if you're typing it into Google, this is probably what you're going to see. Jaguar USA, Jaguar sedans, SUVs, sport cars, all these different things. But you, my friend, you guys happen to be an Arab sheep. You're in the market for an actual Jaguar, not a car, not the football team, but you could afford that too. You want a cat, a jungle cat. So what do we do? We're getting results for cars. We want a jungle cat. We want to talk to the World Wildlife Foundation to adopt a Jaguar. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start excluding terms that we're seeing in our searches. So we don't want cars. So what are we going to do? We're going to come up here and type in minus car. But it's still giving us some car results, but we're getting lots more Jaguar picks. That's kind of nice, right? But every now and again, you're going to get like the Jaguar store. I'm pretty sure that's actually for cars. So let's see if we can get even further. Type in vehicle. Does that remove car results altogether? Mm, let's close. In fact, I'm not sure what these are up here. What this is, the Jaguar doctor is very, it's very enticing. What is this? So again, this is how you guys do. Okay, so it's definitely a car company. So it's going to be very difficult. Let's see if I can get one more in here. Dealership. Let's see if we can get rid of that. No, it just brings more cars into it, right? So, okay. So if we go back a little bit here, we can see that Google's going to be playing some games with us a little bit. However, if we type in Jaguar, it's going to be the first result we get. If we get rid of cars here and do minus car, you can see that pictures of Jaguars actually show up. Now, Rich is asking, what if we put in a plus sign here, plus cat? Look at that. So you can combine your search operators to get far closer to what you're looking for before. So Rich, thank you very much for that suggestion. That's awesome. So look at what you're seeing here. This is essentially word math is what you're doing in Google. I want Jaguars, but I don't want cars, but I do want cats. And Google's gonna be like, here you go. Thank you for being very clear about what you wanted. Here are cats, the amazing Amazon big cat, right? So that's something that you can consider. Excluding terms, adding terms, using these two search operators back to back produces a tangible result that was still a little ambiguous with minus car here, right? Even if we went, let's say with minus vehicle to be more general, that works. So minus vehicle is pretty good, but you're still seeing some of those results in here anyway. So again, if we do in plus cat, that removes some ambiguity and Google's like, oh, okay, this is what you want, right? So we can see we have 37 million results with this very specific search. If we go backwards, we have 332 million. And if we go backwards one more time to Jaguar just by itself, we have 482 million. So we started 482 million, 252 down to our smaller like 40 something million, right? So we started broad and we worked our way to this point here where we have specific information and we didn't need to do a lot to do it. Minus car plus cat. Really, Google? I shouldn't even be wasting my time with you. I'm not a robot. Boom, there you go. <laughs> right? So, okay. Um, I just wanted, again, to reiterate just a couple of these Google search operators for you. So, finding a range where you're finding prices or years, exact matches for quotes or incomplete information that you might have and excluding terms and maybe adding a term on the end to make sure that you can remove all the extraneous results that Google will feed you if you do a more general search, right? So let's talk a little bit about online reviews. Let's get these cats out of the way. We don't need cats anymore. So let's talk a little bit about online reviews and researching hardware and software. So performing research for useful hardware and software is an essential skill to have as an entertainment professional. So again, no matter your degree program, it's going to be important for you guys to understand how to shop for a computer, how to buy the correct speakers if you're in audio, uh, if you're in music production, best headphones, the type of cameras that you might want if you're in cinematography, the lenses for those cameras, um, some of the lights that you want to have, uh, your boom mics, your microphones. Um, if you're in entertainment business, you have to think about, well, 
you want your main laptop? Do you want a travel laptop to go along with it? Well, what if you're teleconferencing? What kind of microphone are you going to use? What kind of web camera are you going to use? You're going to have to do research to find the best um, equipment for your specific use case, right? So having that skill is going to be important. You guys are going to get your tech kit uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and that will give you your first taste of the hardware and software that you'll be using. But by no means should you stop with the tech kit that you receive. That treat that as your base, and then you start expanding with new pieces of gear that you use to help enhance your creative output, or gives you the ability to enhance a skill that you learned in one of your future classes. I don't have the tools for that, but I did some research. I found this one. This is a great beginner set for me to really kind of bang on for a bit, get used to it before I buy something super expensive for maybe a discipline that I'm toying with, I'm hobby, being a hobbyist with it. But if I feel like I can turn that into like the income generating sort of thing, maybe you want to invest in that nicer equipment, right? So this is my workstation, one of my workstations well, that I use, and I use two of them. The one I'm sitting at right now is in this image down here where I have the widescreen monitor. I've got my laptop here. I've got my head, my microphone here, and I've got my 60 FPS camera here with my, my, uh, my speakers and my keyboard and my nice chair. It's really ergonomic, right? So you guys, do you guys think I did research for every single bit in Bob that you see on this desk right here? I'm not even going to like wait for you to answer yes. The answer is yes. I did all of my research, even for the PlayStation controllers, the charger for the PlayStation controllers, because I need my equipment to last. I treat my stuff really, really well, but I also keep my receipts, right? And I also do my research to make sure that if I'm going to buy a curved monitor from the same company as this one, I want to make sure that those monitors are going to be compatible, make sure that they have the right frame rate, the same color gamut, the same resolution, right? I'm getting into the very specifics, but that's, that's the thing that you want to start honing in on when you're looking at professional equipment and things that will fit your use case. I use these computers for various different things. Like you can see right here, I'm editing my novel, right? I don't need a giant 32 inch curved monitor to edit my novel. I could use a laptop for that, right? So this is not the primary use case for this. It's just one of them. So I have a multifunctional computer and I use it for multiple things. Never would I ever spend this much money to use Microsoft Word all day, right? That wouldn't make any sense. So if you do find yourself like, let's say you're in the writing program, you probably won't need a huge elaborate setup like this. This use case is going to be maybe uh, unless you're a hobbyist and you want a computer set up like this, more power to you, but it probably won't be what's required of your job. You might need a webcam, you might need a, a, a microphone and a nice screen in your laptop and that's it. You won't need multiple laptops, extra monitors and Alexa with your cup holder, your multiple laptops. You may want some of that stuff, but it's not going to be necessary. And it's something that you could scale up to over time if this is something that you're interested in. And this took me about six or seven months to put this whole rig together. And I've added on to it. I've pulled things away. I've reorganized it. So also consider the ergonomics of the system that you're going to be sitting next to. So when you get your tech kit in the future, set it up, see how it feels. And don't feel like you have to be beholden to something that might be uncomfortable. Switch things around, move your monitor over here, move your computer over here, move your keyboard back or forward. And that can inform some of your needs for future equipment that you buy. I have this extra bit of space on my desk. I can maybe use another laptop here or speakers or another keyboard or another DAW, right? You might have um, the ability to kind of workshop what you need as you need it. Um, and you can start building up your workstation, right? So Amazon and other websites will have product reviews of varying quality and filtering through user reviews for popular products can help you focus your search. Now let's go over to Amazon. So we've done a search here for an MSI desktop that's in the range of $1,100 to $2,000. We're looking to spend a little bit of money on our laptop, or on our, our desktop rather, right? And this is the one that we found. Now let's take a look here, very close look. There's only one left. Look at this price, guys, $4,000 for a, a, a desktop computer. This thing better be able to simulate reality for this kind of money, right? This is a lot of cash to be spending on a computer. Now, look how many reviews there are for this computer. Do you guys see this? 22 reviews for a $4,000 piece of equipment. So let's take a look at some of these reviews. That one looks decent. That one looks decent. That one looks decent. That one looks decent. There's a couple that are short, but for the most part, they're long. Now, I want to ask you guys is 22 reviews for this product 
enough for you guys to make a determination about whether or not you would spend $4,000 on something like this. 22 reviews are not enough. Okay, okay. So next question I have for you guys. How many people do you know are in the market for a computer that's $4,000, whether it's overpriced or not, Mason? How many people do you know in the market for something this expensive? Maybe a few of you, maybe one or two. So let me stop right there. Does the fact that this is a high ticket item with only a few reviews make sense? Does that make sense for you guys? Like it kind of follows that not a lot of people would buy a product like this. So therefore there probably wouldn't be that many reviews for it. So seeing that these things kind of don't add up, I've seen some mixed answers in, 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 in the chat. You guys aren't right or wrong. I just wanna give an idea of where your head's at. So the most important thing is you're just to not follow these numbers because these numbers aren't really working in the favor of this product, right? This is too expensive and this is not enough reviews for me to make a determination. So what do you have to do from there? The qualitative information that you're presented with is not enough for you to work with. So now you got to go to the quantitative. You've got to read what these reviews have to say. These reviews may not sway your decision one way or the other, but it helps to come in here and see like, okay, if someone has a verified purchase, they bought this thing, why do they like it? What would convince me out of this review to maybe take a second look at something this expensive, right? So this is a fairly long review. It's comprehensive. There's pictures. We can see that this person actually got what they paid for. Same for this review here. This is a little bit shorter, but it gives you some information about what their experience is like. Super fast, good, good. These are the types of reviews, no matter how, if they're five star or not, these are what you wanna be very careful about. I was gonna put together my own rig, but I decided to check out this PC and it's great. Save myself assembling chores. Is that enough? Is this enough information to make a decision, a $4,000 decision? No. Neither is this. Neither is this. Perfect as advertised. Uh -uh. Right? Even these really well written comprehensive reviews might not sway your decision on a price point like this. You're like, you know what? I need to go to YouTube and see what this machine is all about. I need somebody to rotate in front of me. I need somebody to open this computer up to see what it looks like inside of it to get their pros and cons. I want them to set it up like a rig, like I would see it at home before I can even start making a decision about this. You want a more 360 degree, three dimensional understanding of a product this expensive, right? For me, if I'm gonna buy something for $4,000, I'm going to go get it in person. I wanna walk around it. I wanna knock it a little bit make sure that it's actually what I'm getting. I would never click buy now on a product that this expensive from Amazon. It's tough, it's tough, right? So as you guys can see, sometimes the numbers for these products don't add up. You're like, wait a minute, why are there so few results, re reviews for this? It's also a high ticket item. So I gotta read these reviews to see if this makes sense. Now, conversely guys, what about this? $8.99, far more approachable. Most people can afford this, everybody, knows somebody with an Apple laptop. Look how many reviews we have here, 16,000 reviews. Does the fact that this product is cheaper and has several many times more reviews, does this make you more comfortable or less comfortable? Because anybody can just write a review. What if the reviews are deceptive? What if they're not detailed at all? How much sifting are you gonna have to do to find something good in all of this? Dartel says 50-50, right? A little bit more comfortable, Shawanda, okay. More comfortable, how can we compare your specs? 50-50. In fact, I'm loving this, guys. I'm glad that you guys are still being skeptical, even when you're seeing numbers that are a little bit more reflective of reality. Most of this is gonna be out of our reality. Like, I'm not paying for this kind of thing. I can barely afford something like this. It would break me, right? This, on the other hand, far more approachable. But when you look at these reviews, you got 16,000 to choose from, this one's in Spanish, which is cool. Remarkable laptop, great, awesome notebook computer. You're also going to get reviews in here that are very short, some that are very long, some that are comprehensive, some that are very basic, right? So in this case, sometimes the numbers will work out in its favor. This is a price point that I can afford. There's 16,000 reviews. It's got mostly five stars, some six, some four, very few three, two, or one. This might be a product that I can invest in. 
generally, we know someone with an Apple laptop and you can ask them questions. Hey, you got your laptop, you've had it for a couple of years. How's it been treating you? You can go back to YouTube and then look at user reviews for products like that as well. So you can see someone opening the laptop, spinning it around. And if they're like one of those, those paid reviewers, they're not gonna be scared to open up the laptop and rip it open and show you what it looks like on the inside and point things out. Things that you would never do with your own personal laptop. That's something that you can get away with using user reviews um, on YouTube. So I'm showing you Amazon and some of the things that you need to look for when using this, but YouTube cannot be discounted as a fantastic tool when, um, when you're looking at a product that you're looking to buy, whether it's a huge ticket item or something that be a little bit more modest, like a MacBook Pro, generally isn't modest at $899, but this is far more, far more um, approachable, right? So that's generally what you want to look for, quality over quantity. If they include pictures, awesome. If you can see that people found it helpful, that's good. If there's a profile picture, sometimes that matters, sometimes it doesn't, right? A lot of these don't have profile pictures, but people found it helpful. And we can see that these are verified purchases. So there's little bits and bobs in these reviews that help you have some confidence about um, what you're buying. So I want to ask you guys one more thing. How many reviews are you comfortable with using before you buy a product? No right or wrong answer. I just want to see where you guys are at. One review, two. Joe says 100, <laughs> a thousand or more. Now you guys are playing with me. Five to 10 from Evan seems to be a fair number. James says he's totally feels comfy, completely cool, total respect there. Rashad says 10 to 15, eight to five range for Kenny. So you guys are doing some research, you're doing your due diligence until this, Dartel says until my brain starts to smoke. That's hilarious. So until you're comfortable, right? So cool, I'm seeing five to 10 for the most part, depends on the product. You guys aren't just going out all willy nilly and just buying stuff. I don't see any ones, I barely see any single digits in here. Five is a good number to go with to make a determination about whether you spend that money. Like for me personally, if I'm looking at a MacBook Pro for $8.99, I read five good reviews, I'm halfway there. I read 10, okay, I'm feeling good. I look at a YouTube video on top of that, all right, I think I'm gonna make an investment in this. So I need a little bit of extra work to get me to buy something. So 10 reviews and then a YouTube video to make me feel comfortable with a specific purchase, right? And sometimes that might be a little bit more, um, you might be more strict depending on how expensive something is, or you might be more strict because of how critical that component will be. Like if you're looking for a new HDMI cable, you're probably not gonna be stressing over the 599 cable with a three, a star review. You're like, I just need a cable right now. It's cheap. Let me get this Amazon, please. I'll replace it with a nice one later. And it suits all your functions. Completely cool. But if you're looking to replace a mouse or your chair or your monitor, something that's going to be a little bit more involved, something that's really critical to how you conduct your work, uh, you're going to want to do some research. You're going to want to do your due diligence. But generally, the cheaper the item, the fewer the reviews, because there's less financial risk involved in a five to ten dollar purchase versus a five hundred to a thousand dollar purchase, right? So I'm glad that you guys um, are not just being heart set in stone. I'm seeing some ranges here, but ultimately it will depend on your comfort level, what it is that you're buying, the use case for what you're buying it for, and just how you feel that day. Sometimes you're just not in the mood to take anybody's nonsense. You're like, you know what? Now that I don't like this review. I no longer like this product because of this review. It could be an advertisement, a sponsorship. Something just turns you off to it. And you're like, you know what? I'm not buying this. I will find an alternative at some point, but not today, right? So it's very easy to get overwhelmed by all these reviews and trying to make a decision, but by no means should be you feel like you're forced into making a decision. These are just data points to help you come to an eventual judgment on whether or not this computer might be worth your time. These speakers headphones, monitor, keyboard, mouse, whatever it happens to be, by no means are you going to be compelled to hit that buy now button. You can just add it to your cart. Or what I like to do is I like to add it to the list. I have lists for like the apartment that I moved into. So now I've got my MacBook on there. And if I go to the list, you can see all the stuff that I wanna buy eventually. Some of this I'll never buy. Some of it I'll eventually get to. But I do my research. I do my due diligence on the products. I read all the reviews. And once I'm happy with that, I just add it to the list. And then I eventually come in here and maybe buy it, right? And yes, I've been looking into soundproofing. I've been looking into a home gym as well. So it's one of those things where I'll eventually get to all this stuff. But by no means are you beholden to your decision making. 
when you guys are doing research for products that you want to buy, right? So let's get this out of here. Let's go back to our slides here for a minute. And just quickly, I want to go over some things that you want to look for when you're looking for, when you're checking out reviews. These are things that you want to keep in mind. Um, you want to make sure that there's a lot of details about the reviewer. The more, con the more comprehensive their profile, the better. They've got a little image here of themselves. You can see their year, how long they've been a member, how many reviews they've left. That's important. Plus the number of review scores. Like, so if they've left five reviews and they're all five star, probably not worth your time. If they leave 100 reviews and those reviews are like 3.5, some good, some bad, some great, some awful, that gives you a more well-rounded understanding that this person isn't trying to fool you. They're legitimately reviewing the products and sometimes they have a good score. Sometimes they feel like they're scammed, kind of like what we talk about in this week's discussion, right? So we also want to see if there are people found it helpful. This is something that you see on Amazon. Six people found this helpful, 500 people found this helpful. And that can um, give you an understanding of whether or not this review is worth your time. Because if people found it helpful, it might be a case for you to kind of stop take some time to actually read the review and see if there's anything in there that you see that might be um, able to sway your opinion. Well, if people, 500 people found this helpful, let's see what this is all about, right? It might help you inform your opinion about what you want to do. And if it's a verified purchase, even better. And then again, the actual review itself, never mind the number of stars, never mind how many people found it helpful. What do they have to say? Is it a balanced review where they're talking about good and bad, pros and cons, or is it a review where they're just trashing the device like it had, like it, like it. They have a personal vendetta against an inanimate object, or are they just praising it to the to the sun? Are they just putting it on a pedestal that's undeserved for the product that it is? Right. So that's something that you want to keep in mind as well. Is it relatively well written? Is it two sided? And is it subjective in the fact that like this person had an experience with the product? They're just not trying to sell it to you because um, they want you to buy the thing, right? And this is what you want to avoid. If you can't tell who the poster is of their review. If their reviews, like they left one review and it's a five-star average, probably a bot, not worth your time. Um, nobody found it helpful. You can't tell if they bought it or not. And the review has um, all sorts of superlatives in it. These are the greatest headphones ever. R, singular letter instead of the entire word, multiple explanation points, JBO, pure bass sound. Like why would you include one of the features in this product review that like this doesn't have anything to do with the actual product. This is just the name of your name dropping at this point. Why would you name drop a product in the middle of the product that you're reviewing unless you're a bot or you're trying to fool someone, right? So there's gonna be things in here that don't make sense. There's extra information that doesn't need to be here. Uh, you can connect without word to your Bluetooth. The headphones last an amazing hour, last an amazing 11 hour battery life. If you see awkward sentences like this where it's not really clear who wrote it or why they wrote it, or if they were even like, if they even understood English enough to write this, some bots are pretty good at giving you a decent review. Some of these are handwritten and you can tell that it's not written by someone that speaks English as their first language. Um, and it's one of those things where you can tell if this is a bad review, not worth your time. And that's what you essentially want to look for. The more comprehensive and balanced the review is, the more information that you see here, the more balanced it is. Uh, and so this is going to be worth your time. You could take this data point file it with your others, and you can use that to help you make a decision. And if you see reviews like this, just completely ignore them. They're going to be everywhere no matter what you're reviewing. Like that list of 16,000 Amazon reviews for a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air, there's probably tons of reviews that look exactly like this, mixed in with all the reviews that look like this. So you're going to kind of see them back to back. And this will help you, this week will help you, pierce a parsey's out at a glance. You're like, okay, this one's good. This one's not good. That review is good. This one's terrible. This one's terrible, but this one's also good. I can use those three good reviews, ignore those two bad reviews, and then go on and find, again, be able to form the decision that I want to make whether or not I buy this product. And this is a link that I want to share with you guys to help you test yourself. Some of you might ace this, some of you might have a little bit of a tough time for, with it, but this will help you kind of assess where you are uh, in terms of your mindset, in terms of um, determining whether or not you can tell if a review is fake or not, or if a review is trying to fool you into buying a product that isn't worth your time or an experience that isn't exactly what it's uh, purported to be, right? Some people get five out of five. I got three out of five the first time I tried this. I'm much better at it, but if you scroll down, you will see this test yourself. This will allow you to um, 
come up with, with the determination about how good you are at sussing out these reviews. And Ryan, you don't have to take this quiz. It's just a little for fun thing, just to see if you were like, okay, if I got two out of five, maybe I need to concentrate on the concepts for this week to make sure that I have an understanding of what this looks like in the real world. You might even go check out some real reviews, um, just scroll them for a bit, come back and take the test again, you get better. Um, you get a better result. And I can, again, help you understand what it takes to see through what they're trying to fool you with in the bad online reviews. And if you can suss them out, again, that just helps you at a glance, understand what information is going to be helpful for you when you're looking for a new product to buy and information that will not be helpful for you, right? <laughs> no problem, Ryan, no problem. So that is something that I want to include for you guys in, um, in chat. You're not supposed to answer that. You're, you don't have to complete that quiz, but it, it is just a little fun thing for you guys to uh, to work on in case you want a bit of a warm up because we are asking you to assess some reviews for this week's activity. So let's talk a little bit about those. So this is now week two. And yes, Rich, so the, the week two session for Stacy was earlier this morning, so they did cover this information. So if you went to that live class, this is going to be the exact same information, right? So the 2.1 activity, they showed you this last week. That, that's not correct. That last week was week one. Anyway, um, this is what you guys are going to be answering for the 2.1 activity. What is one of the best ways to narrow down your search results when using a search engine? So this is what we want you guys to answer. Uh, in two to three sentences, you can use examples from the live class. You can use the search engine operators that we talked about, which was excluding terms, using exact quotes, and finding a range, right? So Scott, I can answer that question after the session is through. But uh, yes, this is what you're going to be answering for the 2.1 question. And that is going to be located here in the 2.1 activity. If you scroll down, question is right here. And the live class recording that we are recording right now will be posted here at the top. So you can scroll through. If you're in my class, you can scroll through and go to where we talked about search operators and use some of that to inform your answer. James, the live class recording is being recorded at this moment, so it won't be available until like two hours after we're done tonight. So since it's being recorded, the recording doesn't exist of this meeting. All right, so that's 2.1. Let's go on and move on to 2.2. Actually, let me go through these slides really quick. So 2.2 is reviewing the reviews, and this is where you guys are going to be looking at a set of three reviews that we have provided to you, and you're going to make a determination about whether they're legitimate or not, whether they're useful or not, and you're going to be using information in those reviews to formulate your answer. I'm going to show you what that looks like. 2.3 is going to be your discussion for this week where you guys are talking about an online purchase that you've made, about whether something was a score or a scam, Oh, that's totally okay, Rich. No worries, no worries. Uh, yeah, we open up the class on Sunday, so it does kind of feel like there's been quite a bit of a time. Uh, it technically was last week, right? So again, the Squirter Scan discussion this week is gonna talk about something that you guys have bought in the internet space. It could be on Amazon, it could be on Best Buy, it could be Newegg, it could be like any website where you bought something online, right? And we want you to talk about the purchase that you made, whether it was an awesome purchase, you got exactly what you were hoping for, maybe more, than you were hoping for, and then a purchase that you feel like you got scammed, you got your money stolen, you bought a lemon, not worth your time or energy, right? We want to know what you guys went through. And then 2.4, this is going to be the project for this week where you guys are going to be using search engines. And you're going to be doing a search engine operator exercises. And then there's going to be an exercise where you guys are going to go out and shop for a computer within a specific price range to run a program of your choice. You're not going to be spending real money, but if you've got the real money, this might be an exercise that helps you make a determination about whether something that you're going to purchase in the future is right for you. So that is all of our slides. Let's get those out of the way. Go through these activities here in our last couple of minutes together, and then we'll open the floor to any final questions that we might have, that you guys might have. Okay, 2.2. So if there is a product, there's a review for it, and we want you guys to see if you can suss out all the, uh, the, the bits and bobs, the discrepancies between these reviews so that you can find out whether or not they're, deter they're legitimate or fake, because it's going to be a fairly important digital literacy skill for you guys to hone and master when you start buying new equipment. And this is gonna allow you to have multiple perspectives on what to look for in that process. So when analyzing the reviews below, please look for the points of each review and why it may or not be useful as a point of reference for making a potential purchase. We don't want you to just say review is fake 
and leave it at that. Review is legitimate and leave it at that. That's too brief. We need you to provide some evidence and we have some questions that you need to answer in as much detail. And we also include that article that I just linked in chat, how to spot a fake review. So this might be a good warm up activity. Take that quiz, read through this article, get a feel for what we're asking for you to do, and then come in here and knock this stuff out. So in the completion field below, which is down here, you're going to be answering your question right here. So copy and paste these questions because they're the exact same for all three reviews. So you can come over here, copy review question one, review question two, review question three, put them all in the completion area and answer them there. And um, that will allow you to submit this. And then we can give you your feedback after you've submitted that. So this is the first review. So we have James uh, made a solid choice, but time will tell. And then he kind of goes through his experience of buying this product. And the review questions that you're going to be answering for all three of these reviews is, do you think this review is more likely legitimate or fake? This can be a single word or a single sentence answer. I think this review is legitimate. Okay. I think this review is fake. Okay. Question two is where we're going to get you. What parts made you think that? So what part of this review? So look at his profile picture, look at the rating, look at the title, look at the review, look at all his profile information, the age, the year, the number of reviews, the average score. So if you say that this review is legitimate, you can say, okay, I pointed to this piece of evidence, this piece of evidence, this piece of evidence, and this one, and that's why I think this review is legitimate, right? And you're gonna be doing the same thing for number two with Ethel. One star review, maybe a couple of typos in here, um, she seems to be an older lady and doesn't use computers very often. What do we say about this from review? Is this going to be legitimate or fake and why? And then we have Zoe, where she's very happy with her product. It's a little strangely written. There's strange things going on here, maybe some spelling errors. Some of the math over here doesn't really work out either. So maybe this is something where you're like, I don't know if I believe Zoe here. And here's why. I noticed this, I noticed this, 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 and this doesn't add up. These two things don't add up either. And I was really uncomfortable about this. Why would she do this, this, and this, right? And that will help inform your answer for number two for each of these reviews. Now, I wanna stop and mention something here. Let's say you go through and you get this question wrong. You say that a, a review that's actually legitimate is fake, or you say review that's real, or a review that's fake is actually legitimate. Like you, you kind of mix those two up, like I kind of did, right? We're not assessing you on a right or wrong basis. Let's say that you say Ethel's review is fake and it happens to be legitimate. I'm not giving you guys the answer. It could kind of go either way. I want you guys to give us the determination, but if you come up with a good set of reasons, evidence-based reasons as to why you believe one way or another, you will not get counted wrong if you get the first question wrong. We're looking for your analysis and how you're thinking. So this question is not nearly as important as this one, because we're asking you to find evidence. We're asking for you to come up with a reason as to why you think it's legitimate or fake. So if you get this one wrong, because you're like, you're looking into it, you're maybe thinking about it a little bit too hard, where it seems real, but you're not sure, and it's a 50-50 call, don't worry too much about that. As long as you can back up your answers with evidence from the review, that's what we're looking for. That's what we want you to do for this, this assignment, right? So you have three reviews, two questions to answer for each one. Do you think this review is more likely legitimate or fake? And the big one, what parts made you think that? And be specific on a review by review basis. And this is the rubric that we're using to assess you. We're looking for rubrics response questions, looking for you to answer both of those questions in complete detail. And we're looking for you guys to run spell checks so you're not running into any mechanical errors and that will be 5% of your total grade. And your 2.1, just for uh, thoroughness sake, is 2%. So two and five for seven total. And the next one, the next 5% is gonna be scored or scanned review. And again, we are running out of time, so I'm gonna be very brief on this. This is gonna be very similar to what you guys did last week with your, your, um, your first discussion. There's some topics that you need to answer, but we do have you guys format your answers a little bit differently for this week. So Brian is asking, do I have to copy and paste the questions and then answer them, or is it acceptable to write a review one, two, three, and answer all? Either one, Ryan, as long as we have the answers to your questions, you don't have to copy and paste it. You can just have number, legitimate or fake, and then number two, and then you answer it out for whichever review. As long as we can identify which review that you're assessing, that's completely cool. You don't have to write the questions and the answers or copy and paste or anything. Okay, so this week, our discussion will focus on your experiences with online purchases. Did your search for reviews on your purchase help you make a score? Or did you feel like you were scammed out of your money? 
So in addition, we'll also introduce some of the functions of the discussion toolbar so you guys can get used to using them, some of that too. So the questions that we want you to answer are right here. This is your initial post. It needs to include the four following points and I will reiterate this. Your discussion post is gonna be due tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. Thursday morning, your first initial post will be late. Your, answer, your post that answers these questions, if you provide it on Thursday, it will be considered late and that's a 10 point deduction. So you still have tonight and all through tomorrow night to get this part of your discussion done, right? So number one, what type of experience was it? Was it a score or was it a scam? And support your answer by sharing the name and the description of the product and how you made the choice to buy it. So tell us a little bit of a story. I bought this for this reason because I was thinking I needed it for this, but it ended up being better than what I expected. And then you kind of go on from there, right? And when you identify the product, use the discussion toolbar to bold the name of the product. So we're going to be grading you on your answer and on the fact of whether or not you bolded the, answer, the name of the product. So you're getting graded on a couple of different things here, your answer and using the formatting tool. Where did you buy the, where did you purchase it online? So this could be amazon.com, bestbuy.com, whatever. And you're going to underline the name of the website. And then we want you to find a review that shares your likes and dislikes of the product. And we want you to copy and paste that review and italicize it. For this question, guys, for number three, please don't copy and paste a review that's longer than the rest of your discussion post combined. We see students do this all the time. We know they don't mean harm by it, but it makes, look, it makes it look like your discussion post is huge, but really half of it you didn't even write. It's somebody else's words. So use a review that's like a paragraph, maybe a couple of sentences that really hones in on your experience. I had a great experience. This review short, it fits. I had a bad experience. This review is also short, it fits, right? We're not looking for your review to be huge. I've seen multi-page long reviews for this question, and it took me a while to figure out what they actually wrote in their discussion post. So please don't let this happen to you. It can get you, um, you, can, you can lose points if this is too long. So um, Damien, this can be maybe something that isn't technology related, but we do have a prompt here at the bottom. Uh, if your initial, let's see, where is it, where is it, where is it? If you previously purchased a piece of equipment or gear related to your degree program, we encourage you to use it as an example for your discussion post, but that is not mandatory. So if you haven't bought a mouse or a keyboard or a monitor or a, 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 I can't even say camera, a camera or a mic or a laptop, and you don't have those as online purchases to use, you can use an article of clothing, shoes, maybe jewelry, um, like a watch or something like that as an online product that you bought. We just encourage you to talk mostly about industry things, if that's something that you can do. So find a review for number three and number four, help everyone visualize the product by adding a picture of it and using the discussion toolbar, you're gonna to insert a picture into your discussion post. So Ryan is asking, what if it's a one-sided review or possibly fake review? Does it matter if those are used? Ryan, that's where you're gonna put on your thinking cap and say, this review looks fake. I'm not gonna use it for my discussion post. This review looks pretty legitimate. It fits all the points of what I'm looking for. It's fairly balanced. I'm gonna use this one instead. So Ryan, it's gonna count on you to kind of do some of the things that we've talked about tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So find a review. If it doesn't fit the criteria of what you're looking for and it feels kind of, mm, I don't know about this, disregard it and find another one that does fit the criteria. We do want you guys to use real high quality reviews for these. Just we ask that they don't be too long. And then the above prompts ask you to apply some specific uses of the toolbar. And we wanna show you what those are. So we're not gonna ask, gonna ask you to italicize and bold and insert a picture and not show you how to do those things. So when you're down here and you're doing your discussion post, you will see your toolbar up here. So there's the bold button, here's the italics button, here is the underline button, and here is where you can add an image and you'll get an image, uh, an inset that looks like this and then you can drag and drop, grab from your computer and put in your image uh, for your discussion post. So we are asking you to use these tools that we outlined on the discussion toolbar, and we're asking you to use bold for the product name, italicize for the website that you bought it, excuse me, underline for the website that you bought it, and italicized for the user review that you copy and paste, and then we want you to insert an image into your post. This is the rubric that we're using with Seshu. It's the exact same as last week. Was your post relevant? Were you thorough and clear? Did you reply to at least one of your classmates for the thorough response that's four to five sentences long? And did you run spell check so that you can infer your full 5% for this activity? If we scroll down here, if I go to my review, you can see 
I wrote one myself. Your instructor also writes these reviews. So you, has any, you guys have an example of what this looks like. So you can see I have a story here. I've got my product bolded. I bought it here, Amazon. So you can see that this is underlined right here. And this is the review that I used. It's only a basic paragraph. And then boom, you can see the actual product that I bought. And this is exactly what we're looking for you guys to do as well. So tell us a little bit of story about the product. Bold the, uh, the product name. Where did you get it? Underline where you got it. And then italicize your review and then give us a, a, a screenshot of that product. And yes, Michael, you can hyperlink the website as well. And Mona, Mona Lisa, if you want to review the previous recordings for each class, that is under the meetings tab. And then go to past and then pick your live class. So meetings, past, pick your live class, and then you'll be good to go. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you guys is 2.4. This is the last thing that I have for you. We are officially over on time, but I have one more thing to show you, and I've got an example. So if you guys are willing to stick it out, I really appreciate your patience with me. There's one more thing, and you guys have had lots of good questions. I really appreciate you guys asking your questions, but I have just a little bit more to get through before I can open the floor to all your questions. Okay, so 2.4, this assignment is going to cover the basics of search engines and search engine operators. And after that, there's a Word document that is a template that we're asking you to download and fill out. There's nothing that you need to make from scratch for this. You're just filling it out information for this particular project. And after that, there's a Word document that you'll download. It says two activities. Part one, you're going to be practicing your search engine operator usage. And in part two, you're going to use a search engine to solve a real life scenario for many in the entertainment industry. So we have some videos here as well that are optional. You don't need these if you're familiar with search engines. You can skip these videos, but if you want like a refresher or just an understanding of the concept for this week, we have a search engine video here. What are they and how they work? And then search operators, how to improve your search results, which is a basic review of everything that we covered tonight, but it's not in the live class. It's like a standalone thing of just a couple of minutes instead of a full hour. And I see someone with their hand up. Just please hold on to your question. I want to get through this before I answer anymore. Okay, so here's a reference guide for all of your um, these search engine operators that you're going to be using for this activity and in general. So you can download this here. And also, you'll want to download this template right here. So just click it. You'll download that, and it should be empty. And then from here, you will work on your assignment. So let's go ahead and get that opened up in Microsoft Office. So you can see the example here, and then the rest are going to be blank. This looks correct. Awesome. All right, so first step, you're going to download that document, open it up, just like we did earlier. In section one of the assignment, Smooth Search Operator, you're going to read each scenario and then write a query to solve it in the space provided using the most appropriate operators. And they start simple and they get a little bit more tricky. There's four of them that we provide to you guys. And in section two, quest for the specs, you're going to use a search engine to solve a common situation for people in the entertainment industry, which is having a specific budget to run a specific program with specific uh, specifications. And you want to buy a computer that um, reaches those specifications and it seeds them so you have a little bit of that extra headroom so that your computer isn't stuttering, freezing, and preventing you from being creative. You don't want a computer that barely runs the program of your choosing. You want it to have a little bit of extra horsepower, right? And we also want you to collect two reviews about the computer that you chose for this project that um, reflect the positives and the negatives. And we want you to link to those reviews. Now, if this sounds like a lot, that's why I have an example so I can show you how all of this is going to be laid out for you guys. And if you're unfamiliar with buying a computer, some of this might be a review for you, some of this might be brand new, but there is a link here that kind of shows you what you need to take into consideration when you're buying a computer. Do you need a desktop or a laptop, Mac or PC? What kind of microprocessor do I need? How much RAM or memory do I need, right? Uh, how much storage is enough? These types of things that if you're not familiar with buying a computer, you don't maybe have a clue about how much is enough for your use case. So this can kind of give you an idea of, okay, I need this much space. Um, if I'm going to be doing lots of graphic rendering, I probably need a lot more memory, so I need to focus on that. If I'm going to be playing games, I need to make sure I have a nice graphics card so I can focus on that. So this can give you an understanding of the basics of what you need in order to have an understanding of what might be need, um, necessary for you to know for this project. So that's that link there. And then once you've completed, you're going to use this right here, this area below, to upload your document. 
And please keep in mind that we do ask you to rename your document with your last name and your first name. This is gonna to happen to somebody. I almost guarantee it. You're going to complete your assignment. It's gonna look great from your side. You're going to leave it exactly as it's listed here and not change the name. You're gonna submit your work and your instructor is gonna be like, yo, Brittany, hey, Ben, hey, Autumn, your assignment is empty, could you resubmit it? And you're like, well, I did the work. Why are you saying that it's empty? For some reason, if you do not change the, the file name of this assignment to include your first and last name, sometimes it just gives us an empty document and we don't know why. It's very strange. So please rename, save as this document, put your first name and last name in there, and then you will be good to go. And if it turns out it happens anyway, I'll have to go back to the drawing board to prevent this from happening to future students. We may have to introduce how to make this into a PDF, but I, I promise you it's happened before. It happens every single month. I don't want it to happen to you. Please change the file name when you upload your project. Screenshots will also not be accepted for the, as a submission for this assignment. We've had them in the past. We do not accept them. So please don't send us any screenshots. So this is what we're using to assess you. Smooth search operator scenarios. Did you fill out all four of those scenarios and are they correct? So we're gonna be looking at both, did you do them? And are they correct? Did the links go to places that they're supposed to? Does this make sense? Quest for the specs, search engine scenarios. Did you pick a, um, a program in your degree program or something related to your degree program? Did you list the specifications? Did you find a computer under the budget? Did you list those specifications? Did you have a review that's positive and negative? And did you link those reviews? So we're asking you to do quite a few things for part two as well. Lots of moving pieces. Now I'm gonna show you how it all looks in practice. And something, and no, Rashad, you're not supposed to um, convert your files to PDF. That might be something we need to introduce if students are still submitting their files and we see that they're empty. I kind of went off on a little rant there, but there's no need for you to convert to PDF. We're just looking for the documents here. I'm glad you guys are listening. <laughs> All right, so this is gonna be 13% of your final grade. And one thing that I wanna mention for writing mechanics is that we're asking you guys to copy and paste reviews that are written by other people. If there are typos in those reviews, your instructors are, are ignoring those because we know that's not your work. It's someone else's words. So you're not gonna get counted off your writing mechanics if someone includes a typo in their review that you didn't write. So don't worry about that. We've had students ask about that in the past. Wanna kind of head that one off a little bit. Okay, now that all of that is said and done, Justin, what does this look like? Let me show you. <laughs> Let me show you what this looks like in practice so you guys have an understanding of what we want you to do. In fact, we're gonna go through the first one together. So this is the document. This is what it looks like from start to finish. There's part one. And if we scroll down, we can see there's part two, quest for the specs. And I'm gonna go through each part here, but we're gonna do the first search engine operator question together. And here's the scenario. I'm gonna go through this entire process and you're gonna do this four times. So for this first one here, you are in the market to buy new headphones to listen to music. You wanna find the best headphones available for $150 and you wanna use search operators to do it. What would you type into Google? Go ahead and type it in the chat guys. What would you type into Google that's as efficient as possible to hit this result? You're in the market to listen to music and you want headphones that are $150. You can even use that cheat sheet on the assignment, on the project assignment if you want to. What would you enter here? That's very close, Shante. You're very close. There you go, Kiara. There you go, June. There you go, Rich. You guys are getting there. So this is what you're going to need. Search engine input, dollars, $150. Headphones. Now, some of you have certain like inclusions, like headphones plus 100 music, like something like this would also be okay. This would be okay. This would also be okay. Like if you're looking for Beats by Dre for some reason, this would also be okay because you're looking for specific headphones. Also, if you're like wanting to be even more specific, like studio headphones, that's not in the scenario, which you can include that in your search query. So you guys are all including correct answers here, but notice how all your answers are slightly different based on how you're kind of interpreting the search operators. Your instructors are going to understand that as long as you have some combination of the price and the subject matter, and maybe a dollar sign in there to make sure that it's understood that this is what you're looking for, that's gonna be completely cool. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab this result. We're gonna go over to Google, right? 
we're going to do a Google search for $150 studio headphones. And then we're going to find a set of headphones that works for this price point. So I see the sign houses here for $149. We're going to click this, go to the website. So these headphones are $149. I'm going to copy this link, go back to my document, paste my best matching result. And that's all you guys got to do. That's it. You're going to enter what you would type into Google, actually type this into Google, give us a search result that hits this scenario. So if we click this link as your instructor, we should see headphones that are going to be around $150. So I click this here. This is the website that I get brought to. Instant, you get 100% on this particular scenario. You're, you're done. You're good to go, right? And that's what you're going to be doing for all four of these scenarios. So you're out browsing Twitter, you come across a meme, you want to buy a graphics card for your PC. Notice that these are very, very long on purpose. I didn't give you guys the correct answer. This is kind of what you would type into Google. If you wanted a big, long, meaty search query, you can condense this down, right? So um, Tan is asking, I don't know how to find a meme on Twitter. So just look up memes. Like, so what you can type in is Twitter and then a meme that you've heard of in the past or you can type in funny memes and then find a result. We're not looking for anything specific here. This is open-ended. So you were browsing Twitter, you came across the meme, you're like, how do I find this again? Well, you would type in what you found, maybe a description and then Twitter, and then you would give us something that looks like this. So trending Twitter memes in Salt Bay gives me this search result that goes to knowyourmeme.com. And then I can scroll through and I can see the dude who's doing this with his hands and he's cutting up the meat and he's got his shades on with his white t-shirt, right? So we're not looking for you guys to give us a specific meme. We just want you to go out and use this in a slightly different way so that you come up with a result. I want to find a meme on Twitter. Here's what I can find. Exactly, James. So trending Twitter meme plus funny would be what you type into Google here. And then you just go searching to see what you find. In fact, that's not what I got. Let me grab that again from what he wrote. So trending Twitter meme plus funny. And then you start seeing memes that you like. And you're like, I want to click on this one. Everyone's tagging their trust, crushing Twitter trust. So you would come in here. Maybe you would click this hashtag and it will bring you straight to Twitter. And then you're like, oh, I want to go with this one. I want to go with this one. This one seems kind of interesting. And then that's what you would link to your, your actual submission here. So again, we're not looking for anything specific with the Twitter one. It's just go out, find something. If this fits the bill, bring it to us and then we'll grade you accordingly. So if we see some sort of meme here or some sort of text with caption or some sort of weird image, we'll understand where you came from. And then again, you wanna buy a graphics card, you're looking to relocate. All of these are slightly different search scenarios. So you're not just doing the same thing over and over again. And we do ask you to do a little bit of like brain teasing here. Like if you're moving, you're looking at cities within 150 to 100 miles of your current residence to get an idea of where you wanna live. There's not like a specific city that you would use here. Like I kind of got this one wrong on purpose. For me, it would be, would be in Orlando, Florida. For you, it might be where you live or maybe somewhere you want to live and you're looking for places within 100 miles of where you want to live. Again, you would fill in the blanks for this scenario with your specific circumstances rather than trying to give us an answer that you think we want to hear, but it, we don't give the information for that answer. We want you to come up with an answer from your personal experience. And you have four of those that you're going to be completing. All right, easy enough. Section two, quest for the specs. This is also very straightforward, but there's a, a step process to it. First step is you want to identify your degree program, music production, cinematography, um, entertainment business, writing, whatever it is. And you have a set of tools here. Like if you're in entertainment business or writing, um, you can choose any of the above that you want to, that you're interested in. But if you're in music production, you have two to choose from film, two to choose from graphic design, animation, two different applications to choose from whichever one you want to pick. It's up to you. So you can go for pro tools here, and then you want to make sure that you're recording the specific technical specifications of what it takes to run pro tools. So you need 16 gigabytes of RAM. You need 15 gigabytes of space. You want an Intel PC that has this, this, and this, and this. And that's going to be some of the information that you include in your template. So after you've selected your, um, your application, you're going to scroll down here, and you're going to fill out that information in this area. So software selected, operating system, processor needed, RAM needed, and the amount of space that I need to install it, right? So you're going to take the information up here. You're going to open the website and you're going to record it here, right? See, easy enough. Step two, 
this is where you're going to do some online shopping, some window shopping, because you are not spending $1,500 of your own money or our money. This is fake money. So we give you a $1,500 budget. Don't worry about tax or anything. To find a computer that has the specifications that will allow you to run the software that you chose at a decent level, right? So for this one, we chose a MacBook Air for $14.99. This is the website that's selling it. So this is on Amazon. And it has the following specifications, Mac OS, the Apple M2 chip, the gigabytes of RAM are a little bit smaller than what we need for Pro Tools. So this isn't the best computer, but Apple computers with their integrated RAM and hardware, they tend to punch above their weight with what they can do. So this might be fairly easy for it to run. So Kiara, you're essentially doing two things. You're picking a program and listing the specifications for what it takes to run it. And you're looking for, okay, operating system, that's what I need to find. Processor type, that's what I need to find in the specifications. Gigabytes of RAM, that's also what I need to find, right? And all that information is gonna be contained in these links. Now, once you have that, the shopping party section, this is where you're gonna be looking for computers that can run this. So for example, we go to Amazon, and we look up computers, right? Let's say we find a desktop here and it's like $1,400, $1,500. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be recording the specifications of this computer in this area right here of the template. So the computer I bought is a MacBook Air. That's not a MacBook Air, but this is the price. This is where it's being sold. And these are the specifications of the laptop. And most, and most times they're listed in the title. So you can see here, this is the processor that it has right here. This is how many bits of RAM it has. This is the storage that it has. This is almost all the information that you actually need. You have the name of the computer, you have the processor, the amount of RAM and the amount of storage. And what are we asking for you to list? that information right there. So Kiara, you're just going to type in tower computers, laptop computers, or you can go over here to Google if you wanna use your search operators. You can do this as well. I want to look for an MSI laptop desktop that's between 1100 and $2,000, or you can type in 1500, and this is how you begin your search, right? So we're not asking for you to find a computer off the top of your head. We're asking for you to do research to find a computer that fits. And if you find a computer that fits, this is 1399, you click here, you see if the specifications can run the program that you chose up here. And if it does, you list the specifications of that computer right here. And yes, Lawrence, this is all that you're doing for 2.4. Now reiterate this one more time. You're gonna click one of these links. There's specifications for these programs, for Pro Tools specifically. You're gonna list all that here. There's no thinking involved. You're looking at the information and recording the information. Step two, this is where you're thinking a little bit. You're going to go to Google. You're gonna search for computers online. You're gonna to go to Amazon. You're gonna search for computers that fit within the $1,500 budget that we've given you. In this example, we're using a MacBook Air. So if we select, click this link here, this sends us to the computer that we found. We're like, oh, this is the perfect computer for this specific project. I wanna use this one. And then I can enter this information into this area here. And Ryan, this isn't on the student portal. This is in the 2.4 project activity where you're going to be completing this assignment. So all of, the, all of this information you're going out and finding on the web and you're putting it in this template that's available in the project activity for week two. So this is where you're finding this template. And then you're going to go out on the internet and find the information that we're looking for you to list for this section of the assignment. So you're gonna find a computer, list the name of it, list the price, where you're going to buy it, and then the, the specifications for the computer. It runs this software OS, this is the processor that it has, this is the RAM that it has, and this is how much storage that it has. And generally, these numbers here for your computer should be higher than these numbers here for your application. So definitely look at that and try to compare those two. And if they don't match up 100%, that is okay. Like for instance, we have 16 gigabytes recommended, but for our MacBook here, we only have eight, but we're also running out of money. So this is the bang that we could get for our buck, best bang that we could get for our buck, so that's okay. And then we want you to find two reviews. Amazon makes this really easy. You scroll down, you find a review, you click the title of it, and then you have the link to the review, 
and the actual review itself. So we don't want you to just copy and paste the text. We want the actual review itself. So your instructor should be able to click this, look at the review written here, and it should be the exact same that we same thing that we see here, right? And if you want to get to this place when you're on Amazon, just click the actual title and it will take you to that specific review rather than the entire list on the product page. And this is what we're looking for you to copy and paste into your document, just like that. And that's what we want you to accomplish for your 2.4 activity. Now we're gonna start from the very top one more time. So section one, smooth search operator, you've given four scenarios to fill out. And this first scenario is the one we did together where you type in, this is what you would search into Google and this is the result that you get. And you're gonna do this four times. Result and then the link to that result. One, two, three, four, quest for the specs, you're going to identify your degree program. You're going to pick one of these two applications. You're going to click the link. You're going to find the system requirements to run this application. And they're going to be somewhere on the page. It's not standardized, but for Pro Tools, we can see that it's right here, right? You're going to then list that information right here. You're just recording what you find. This is the software. It needs Windows. It needs this processor. It needs this much RAM. It needs this much space. Cool then you're going to move to the computer searching place. So Google searches, this is where you're gonna be doing research. This is where you can include your ranges for prices. I'm looking for a computer that's 14 to $1,500, right? And yes, Scott, uh, media communications is listed as a degree right here at the very bottom. This, you're gonna choose any of the above. There's not one specifically listed for media communications or entertainment business. Any one of these will fit, it's up to you because you're going to be working with some of these people. If you're more inclined for film, maybe you want to choose film. If you're more inclined to graphic design, or you like animated films, or you like music, maybe those are be going to be the ones that you want to kind of gravitate towards. Because understanding this language is going to help you talk to people in the media who have to do this for a living, right? And then once you've done all that, Search for your computer, do some research, find a computer that fits the $1,500 price point. And then once you found the computer that, of, that you wanna use, list the title or the name of the product, price point, where you're gonna buy it, and then that information that we're looking for here. This, all of this information matches. Minimum required specifications for your app are going to be the system requirements of the laptop that you've, um, that you've determined is the one for you. So Mac OS 10, Apple M2, the eight gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigabytes of storage, and then one review that's positive, one review that's negative, and we want to link to both of those so that your instructor can either copy and paste the link or click the link to see where your review is hosted. It could be on Amazon, Best Buy, New Word, wherever. We just want to make sure that you didn't just copy and paste this, you did also cite your source because this isn't your information, this isn't your experience. We want to know where you got that, right? And that's essentially what we're looking for. For 2.4, it is a template that you're going to be filling out. You're going to be doing some online shopping. You're going to be doing some search engine operating and optimization with your research. And all of these steps are going to assure that you have a good head on your shoulders when you're doing your research and that you know what to look for when it comes time for you to buy a brand new computer that will supplement your tech kit. All right, guys, that's all that I have for you. We did go a little bit over on time, but I really appreciate you guys hanging out and sticking it out with me while we go through the example here and answer any final lingering questions that you guys have. And if you don't have any final questions, you are free to go. And I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording here. So those of you that have joined us for the recording, I really appreciate your time. Let me know if you have any questions if you're working with me this month. Have a wonderful afternoon.